Okay. Um, again, um, welcome. My name is Dr. Janice Thomas. I am Director of International Education <coughs> here at Brookdale Community College. I am going to share my screen and uh, provide you with the agenda for this evening that was forwarded to me by uh, Jeff Richter. Um, I won't keep the screen up, uh, but um, for, your, um, for your information, we will have just a few words of welcome and introductions um, and perhaps some remarks by Mrs. Crocker. Um, and then Jeff Richter will introduce our uh, speaker for this evening. Um, as I mentioned earlier, I'm Jan Thomas, uh, Director of the International Education Center here at the college. And uh, we are always delighted to work with our friends from New Jersey Haiti Partners. Um, it is so important for us to um, engage with all members of our community and um, we're always happy to do so um, with New Jersey Haiti Partners. I'd like to ask um, a colleague of mine, uh, Mr. Ed Johnson, who currently serves as Executive Director of Governmental Affairs to say a few words of welcome on behalf of the president. Great. Well, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Thomas. I'm very uh, pleased to be here again for our annual uh, Crocker Memorial Lecture Series. And thank you to New Jersey Haiti Partners for uh, working so uh, diligently uh, to make sure that uh, this tradition continues uh, even through uh, the many uh, challenges that we face today. Um, I think this is us being together tonight uh, is a tribute to all that we can do when we work together. And while we faced many challenges uh, over the crisis and the pandemic, I think if we focus on how we have worked together and how we have achieved and we've pushed through and we've continued to stay connected, to stay informed uh, and to meet together in these forums uh, for discussion, uh, to share ideas uh, and information, which only makes us stronger and richer. So on behalf of our president, Dr. David Stout, uh, I'm very happy to welcome you uh, and to thank you for all of your work. And I'm looking forward to our uh, tonight's speaker, Dr. St. Paul and his presentation and uh, the engagement and the rich discussion to come. So thank you very much. And uh, with that, welcome. Uh, thank, thank you. Ed. Oh, thank go, you ahead. Ed. go ahead. Go ahead, Jeff. All yours. Okay, thank you, Ed and Janice. Um, well, at first, I'd like to uh, start by saying a few words about the person uh, whom this event uh, memorializes, Clinton Crocker. Clinton Crocker was the uh, founding president of New Jersey Haiti Partners back in the 1970s. And uh, he was active in partners for the rest of his life. And in fact, uh, once I became involved in partners, he was not only my mentor, he was also my conscience. Uh, Clinton was never satisfied with how much I was doing. And he always pushed me to do more and that I'm grateful to him for that. Uh, so now also having, having said something about Clinton, by the way, Clinton was, a, was an outstanding citizen in New Jersey. He, uh, he, had, he, was, he was active in, uh, in the political world. He was active in the arts world. He was a trustee, not only at Brookdale, but also at Rutgers. And uh, he was one of the people that started the, um, the art center in Holmdale. So he has had a, a very distinguished career. Um, but let me talk for a minute about the lady I'm gonna introduce next, his wife, his Doris Crocker. Uh, Doris was just as involved in partners as, uh, as Clinton was. She traveled for partners. And I wish I had a nickel for every time she hosted an event or hosted a visitor from Haiti. She really had a tremendous piece of keeping our chapter going through good years and bad. And uh, Doris, I'd like to invite you now to uh, make a few remarks. Thank you. 
I know she's on here. Doris, if you've, you've got yourself muted, please unmute yourself. I, know I saw her on the, uh, I saw her on the screen, I saw her. Uh, um, yeah, she's muted and she may or may not be able to unmute. Okay. All right, well, maybe at some point later she'll be unmuted and she'll say a few words with us. So let me introduce our speaker now. Now, uh, the, the thing that strikes me the most about uh, Professor John Eddy Sampol is that he was the founding director of the Haitian Studies Institute at in the City University of New York, which is located in Brooklyn College. I think by doing that one thing, he probably has done a lot more for Haiti than a lot of people who think they've done a lot for Haiti. Because the most important thing I think for the future of Haiti, one of the most important things is that people in the United States and elsewhere become more familiar with Haiti and at least attempt to begin to understand it. Uh, now, some other outstanding things about Professor Sampol, he's actually got degrees from universities in three different countries. How many of us can manage that? And he has also done uh, theoretical and practical work in three different countries, at least three different countries, Haiti, Haiti, Mexico, and the United States. Yeah. So I think that uh, I, can't, I can't imagine anybody who's more qualified to present on the topic that we have this evening. And so I think you've heard enough from me. Now I'd, I'd like you to sit back, relax, and listen to Professor San, listen to Professor San Paul. Okay, okay. <laughs> yeah, give me one second to one second. Okay. Perfect. Let me share my screen. That's my screen. Perfect. Okay. So, um, so um, good afternoon. Good, good afternoon. Good afternoon to everyone. Good afternoon to everyone. Um, it's such a great honor for me uh, to be selected to deliver the six. Uh, Clinton C. Carker Memorial Lecture uh, this year. So an event co-sponsored by Brookdale Community College, um, New Jersey Haiti Partners and Rutgers University. So I'm delighted to be with you all this evening. So I wanted to acknowledge the hard work of the, these collaborative groups to make happen this evening event that is so important to maintain and also to reinforce social and cultural cohesion and connection between the important Haitian community in Brookdale and the American community in New Jersey. So I wanted to uh, gratefully thank Jeff Richter for the kind invitation. So I was asked to address the topic of the impacts of internal economic Politic, social and political divisions on Haitian community living abroad. 
So uh, for the sake of that presentation, I have structured my presentation as follows. In the first moment, I will open with a brief analysis uh, between two important concepts, the concept of diaspora or diaspora and the concept of Haitian living abroad. I wanted to do that distinction in order to highlight some differences between both concepts. Then I will overview some quantitative data regarding the Haitian diaspora, while also stressing on the quantitative weight of that population. Our great capacity, because I do think that the Haitian living abroad, we have a lot of capacity, we have a lot of individuality, but also we have a lot of work to do when it comes to togetherness. So that I will also explain our great capacity to succeed individually. And I will explain why we Haitian living abroad, and or if you prefer a member of the Haitian diaspora, why is not that so difficult for us to succeed individually? But why is so difficult for us to succeed collectively? So in a third moment, I will observe, I will underscore what I have observed or interpret I, some of our potential challenge in the Haitian diaspora. And I will conclude to not this evening lecture with some thought that can help us to increase what scholars have called the social capital. So more specifically in the presentation, so I will start with the quantity, give some few very brief reflection on the quantity, how many Haitian, how many members of the Haitian diaspora or Haitian living abroad. Then we will move with the distinction between Haitian diaspora or Haitian living abroad. So I will talk on our individual success why have we succeeded individually? The idea of Haitian living abroad, I will interpret that in the lecture that we are in a community, but we are in a community in transit, right? So there was like a sociologist, his name was Zygmunt Bowman, and Zygmunt Bowman, he wrote extensively on the idea of liquid community, so I think, for instance, the Haitian diaspora, we are kind of sort of liquid community, what I interpret as community in transit. Then I will talk about the political power in the Haitian community, in the Haitian diaspora. And that on that specific point in the lecture, I will explain that I personally have a mixed feeling on the political power that we have in the Haitian community the way that we have used that uh, political power. Also, I'm not only a sociologist, I do social theory, I do political sociology, but also I am a professor of sociology religion. And since Haiti in Mexico, I have conducted research, empirical research and theoretical research on religion. So I will, to this afternoon, provide a brief diagnosis on the behavior of the uh, religious organization, because I do think that religion, church, they are very important uh, to maintain social cohesion, to create some communitarian ethics in a, any specific community. So we will uh, scrutinize our own religious organization in the Haitian diaspora. And I will wrap up this evening lecture with some key recommendation according to my own opinion that can be useful to strengthen the community of Haitian living people. Okay, so this is what I am proposing to you. So I will stop sharing so you can have more, you know, interaction with me. So let me get started with 
uh, the first one on our quantity. According to recent data, the Haitian living abroad, commonly labeled as Haitian diaspora, they account for 3,500,000 people, which represented the third of Haiti's current total population. However, despite its quantitative weight, the Haitian diaspora does not constitute a political and economic power or economic capital, both in Haiti and abroad. So in today's lecture, I will share with you some thoughts that can help to understand both our strengths and weaknesses and what can be done to build a stronger Haitian diaspora. But because there is not a broad consensus about the concept of diaspora, allow me to clarify it. So first topic, Haitian diaspora or Haitian living abroad? This is a question I will try to answer. Why I am giving this lecture, there is an ongoing debate among scholars policymakers and intellectual about the notion of diaspora or Haitian living abroad. I recall that in 2011, while I was living in Guanajuato, Mexico, where I was teaching in the School of Law, Politics and Government, I had the privilege to travel to Geneva, Switzerland, to be part of an international symposium to commemorate the first anniversary of the January 12, 2010 earthquake that hit Haiti. That conference was held at the University of Geneva in Switzerland. At that symposium, there were talks of debate about the notion of diaspora or Haitian living abroad. Are we a diaspora or are we? Haitian living abroad. Although the notion of diaspora has been popularized, but many scholars and policymakers do not feel comfortable to use the concept of diaspora. Um, and there are many reasons for that. First and foremost, the concept of diaspora in its sociogenesis has been used to refer to scattering of the Jew after the exit, exodus, from slavery in Egypt, and the Jews were dispensing throughout the world in search of dignity, in search of the promised land. But before the January 2010 earthquake, scholars have observed a dispersal of Haitian throughout the world. So in Haitian Creole, we say, this is what we say. That scattering that has been increased after the 2010 earthquake, one can observe after that earthquake, new dynamics in the original configuration of the trend of Haitian migration. After that earthquake, Haitians have migrated in great numbers in countries such as Brazil and Chile, for example. Those brothers and sisters are now part also of what we call the diaspora. But the question I ask, have they too reached the promised land? So I underscore that new dynamic, that new dynamic in order to make you mindful of the complexity of the concept diaspora that is a totally concept. Scholar of migration and immigration have had like that the concept of diaspora is analytically weak, since it does not, in the case of the Haiti, allow us to understand what category of Haitian have reached the promised land and who have not. In some countries, such as the United States of America, Canada, France, Switzerland, Germany, Mexico, among others, we have many Haitians who reach, uh, you know, quote unquote, the promised land. Um, we have Haitian lawyer, president of university, CEO of big corporation, 
provost and dean of school of art science, dean of great medical school. We have distinguished professor. We have tenure full professor. We have registered nurse. We have director of research institute, elected officials such as mayor, council member, assembly member, state senator, member of Congress, attorney general, county commissioner, city clerk, and the like. We have Haitian in every single field of knowledge, discipline, and professions. So in certain way, those Haitians have reached the promised land. For them, the category of diaspora can in some case be applied. But also we have to consider that many other Haitian or people of Haitian descent did not necessarily reach the canal, which is conceived as the promised land. In a book that I'm working on, I had to collect data on homelessness in New York City. According to recent data provided by the New York City Department of Homeless Services, there are about 60,000 homeless people in the city. And the city projected to decrease that number to 40,000 by 2023. But you will be surprised if I tell you that many Haitians are also part of those statistics, right? So um, I usually use the two and five trend in New York City. And I used to see Haitian facing homelessness in the suburb. So as a sociologist, I have a broader view of the diaspora. When we are talking about the Haitian diaspora, we have to be mindful that we are dealing with a complex category. Again, if we follow the religious root of the concept of diaspora, the Jew, they left a place of slavery that was Egypt, they march a long way, they call the desert with the purpose to enter into the promised land that was Canaan. The land flowing with milk and honey, according to the book of Exodus. However, in many places throughout the world, we do have our brother and sister who have not reached that promised land. For those Haitians facing homelessness in many parts, they do not. Uh, you know, reach the promised land. So if Haiti was stable, they would prefer to return to Haiti. And not only them, many of us professionals would prefer to return to Haiti. So when we are talking about the diaspora, how are we talking really uh, about those people also? The other reason for which I think that the concept of the diaspora of is problematic reside in the shortcoming of the notion to foster social and political cohesion among us as Haitian. The diaspora is a category that has been used to foster political exclusion and stigmatization. In Haiti, being a diaspora has been used as a synonym of foreigner. A diaspora can be a stranger on his or her home own land. Why I was writing those lines, I recall a lyric of the crew Zengle, for those who are Haitian, in a song entitled L'Amour par con diaspora, Love Does Not Know About Diaspora, the former lead vocal of the crew Zengle, Gracia Delva, he gives us the material to think sociologically the misconception that Haitian living in Haiti have about the diaspora. In L'Amour par con diaspora, Gracia Delva explained how Haitian women have taken advantage of Haitian men living abroad. In the imagination of the Haitian women living in Haiti, the partner living in the diaspora is sometimes considered just as an ATM whose obligation is sent to send money, remittances in Haiti, but is not respected. Although the song of Zengle and Lamoupa con diaspora, love doesn't know about diaspora, deal only with romantic relations, but the message can be applied to different domains. 
Although I recognize that song cannot be generalized, but it informs us about a crude reality. In Haiti, there are many social groups, the government, some prominent members of the banking sector. For them, the diaspora is like an ATM. The Haitian diaspora has more obligation toward Haiti, but the Haitian, they have few rights. There are many forms of abuse of the Haitian diaspora, and sometimes by our own family members. In Haiti, in the collective imagination, the diaspora is considered as someone who have an easy life and have easy access to money. The category of diaspora has been perverted. So as you might know, in since 2011, in Haiti, the political and uh, political power has been in the hand of a group called PHTK, the Haitian Party of the Bad Hair, under the leadership of Mr. Michel Joseph Martelly, better known as Sweet Mickey, a member of the Haitian diaspora. So as soon as he came into power, Michel President Martelly, without the consent of Haitian living abroad, the diaspora, in an authoritarian fashion, he imposed upon us $1.50 for each transfer sent to Haiti. Martelly's rhetoric was that money would be used to foster and strengthen the educational system in Haiti. Many Haitians living in the diaspora say that was not a big deal if the money will be used to improve education in the country. Because after all, we Haitian, we wanted to see improvement in our community of origin. In this specific context of globalization, the Haitian immigrant is both deterritorialized and re-territorialized. That means the Haitian immigrant behave like a transmigrant who does not lose the type of the community of origin. Based on that rationale, when Michel Martelly came to Brooklyn College in 2012, some member of the, the Haitian diaspora challenged, challenged him on the floor. Why? Others say, not, it's not a big deal. If he will be, see if the money will be used to improve schooling in Haiti. He can do that, he can take the $1.50. But Martelly left office in 2015, and no improvement has been in re registered in that domain. In 2017, Jovenel Moïse came into power and continued with the policy of collecting $1.50 on each transfer that we sent in Haiti. But as member of the Haitian diaspora, we don't have access to dual citizenship. The government and the private sector of business in Haiti treat us as a group that is there to send money to Haiti. We don't have any capacity to then hold them accountable. The idea of diaspora shape also our lack of capacity to build strong coalition to hold accountable the Haitian elite. So I lived in Mexico for 13 years. I complete my PhD there. While working in Mexico, while in Mexico, I work as a researcher for an academic project on the foreign policy between Haiti and Mexico. During my time in Mexico, I never heard a Mexican living in the US, uh, a Mexican living in Mexico, calling a Mexican living, treating a Mexican in living in the US as a diaspora. If a Mexican is living in the US, for example, in Mexico, they said, el o ella está viviendo en el norte. That is, he or she is living in the north. In Mexico, the Mexican is living in the north. The Mexican living in the north is a Mexican full of right as the Mexican living in Mexico. There is no such stigmatization or classification of diaspora. The Mexican living in the north can easily do what we call in sociology and other field of the social sciences, political transnationalism. That means that the Mexican living in the North is encouraging to return to Mexico and to get involved into political, economic, cultural, and social activities. The Mexican living in the North can become senator of the Republic, 
even president of the country. The remittances set is used also to foster strategy of local development. But in Haiti, we don't have that. We don't have that because we accept to be classified as diaspora. We don't ask for the respect of our right. We think that we only have obligation toward Haiti. We accept to be called and classified as diaspora, despite the fact the ministry is called Ministère des Haïtiens Vivants à l'étranger. That is the Ministry of Haitian Living Abroad. If we are a diaspora, why the ministry is not called the ministry of the diaspora? Those are questions that should be thoroughly discussed in a national conference among us Haitian living neighbors. For all the precedent, I am more inclined for the concept of Haitian living neighbors instead of the notion of diaspora, because the latter has a certain elective affinity with political and social exclusion. Now I wanted to talk on the subtopic on our individual success, and I will try to answer the question, why have we been able to succeed individually and not collectively? The main point I wanted to make in that section of the lecture is that the, the Haitian, from an individual standpoint, is a person when having the minimum opportunity, usually achieve excellence. The Haitian has a great capacity of adaptation. He has strong linguistic skills. The Haitian in a record time can manage decently a foreign language. Haitian from an individual standpoint can achieve excellence. Individually, he or she can transition from the status of immigrant to become governor of Canada, president of Rice University, Dean of the School of Art and Science at Harvard University, President of Xavier University of Louisiana, Distinguished Professor at L'Ecole Polytechnique de Montréal and the like. The Haitian is also proud of Haiti. When achieve excellence, the Haitian living abroad is not ashamed to mention the name of Toussaint Louverture, Jean-Jacques Dessalines. He or she feels proud of to be Haitian. Individually, we are great writers, journalists, college professor, nurse, lawyer, musician, painter, engineer, etc. We as Haitian live in a world when a brother or sister succeed in the age of social media, we feel proud to share and reshare the good news. We use hashtag to say that Haiti represents Haiti Lankaila, that is, Haiti in the house. We use hashtag of 1804 as a way to recall to the world that we did, we achieved the most important revolution in modern history. That is the 1804 Haitian revolution. That is true. Indeed, we did the most important revolution. When compared to other revolutions, such as the 1776 American Revolution, Oh, sorry. Oh, and the 1789 French Revolution, the 1804 Haitian Revolution is more advanced in terms of humanitarian and philosophical principles and values, like the respect of human dignity, equality against racism, fraternity, sorority, and solidarity with the oppressed people around the world diversity of human rights and decolonial racial justice. Sorry, I had to take a drink of water very quick. Okay, sorry. Sorry about that. But I wonder why have Haitian living abroad not be able to explore those values to create strong communities? And here I'm using communities in plural. This is a tough question, since a comprehensive answer required to consider a set of multiple factors. Some scholar would argue that we cannot understand the root of our individuality as Haitian living in the diaspora without scrutinizing our colonial and neo-colonial educational training. We have been socialized into a system that has promoted self-success. 
I myself attend congressional school in Torbeck in the south of Haiti and then in Port-au-Prince. Many of you attend those schools as well. So when we have exam, the teacher tell us, you know, bonne chance, chacun pour soi, Dieu pour tous. That is good luck. Everyone might do his own business. God will help you. That education has a negative, profound impact in the way that we interact in, on a daily basis. Our colonial and new colonial educational system has created mistrust in Creole méfiance among us. We are reluctant to join forces to set up business, for example. This is one of the factors that explain that despite the fact that since the 1960s, we had the first important wave of Haitian immigration in the US, after six decades, we own very few things. We are not strong in terms of economic ownership. And you know, if you don't have that, if you know that I'm telling you, without economic ownership, there is no belonging. And without belonging, there is no community. And without economic ownership, we are, we are just a community in transit. Now, the next point is, is the community in transit. I wanted to uh, uh, um, uh, uh, view, review with you. The idea of Haitian living abroad as a community in transit. The idea of community in transit that I'm referring to is very powerful to sociologically diagnose and understand what is commonly called the Haitian diaspora. And it requires to be approached from interdisciplinary research. Yes, we as Haitian living abroad, we are a community in transit. And we cannot understand that without analyzing the dynastic dictatorship of the Duvaliers. For those who are not accustomed to Haiti political history, it is important to inform you that in the context of the Cold War, between the US and Soviet Russia, between 1957 and 1986, the Republic of Haiti was led by the Bouton dictatorship, the regime of the Duvaliers. First, with Francois Duvalier, a medical doctor who became president on October 22, 1957, and led the country until April 1971. Then, before he passed away, Francois Duvalier, or Duvalier, also known as Papador, used the parliament to change the Haitian constitution that will allow his son Jean-Claude Duvalier to inherit the political power in 1971. Jean-Claude Duvalier, also known as Baby Doc, led Haiti until February 7 of 1986. Under that dynastic dictatorship, and more particularly during the regime of Papado, known as Papadocracy, many Haitians from the middle class and kind of Haitian bourgeoisie, they left Haiti and migrated to many countries, particularly in the US. Among those Haitians, there were many political opponents in the region, of the region. When they arrived here in the US or in Canada or in African country or in Latin American country, they always dreamed that the dictatorship of Papa Doc won't, won't last for long. Those Haitians never managed to fully incorporate themselves into the new community of adoption. And that has engendered a very important problem. In their imagination, their body was in New York, in New Jersey, in Connecticut and the like, but their soul, their spirit was in Haiti. Contrary to other ethnic community who managed to integrate into the new community of adoption, the Haitians didn't do that. And that behavior has tremendous, tremendous impact on us until today. I am myself a new immigrant. So I established myself in the US only in 2016. That means I have only five and a half years living definitely here in the US. I came here 
to become the founding director of the City University of New York Haitian Studies Institute. Because of the high profile job that I have had in the CUNY system, I had access to many historical documents of the Haitian community. I have had many conversations with elder members of the Haitian community, folk who migrated here in the 1960s and the 1970s, told me that it was a time that Haitian owned big houses in Park Slope. Park Slope is a, in Brooklyn, an apartment in Manhattan. But upon their retirement, they, are sold, they, sell, they sold them and returned to Haiti. They sold them cheap because they didn't know that Park Slope, for example, would become so valuable place. Currently, we have few Haitians who are homeowners in Park Slope in Brooklyn. I brought this example to make you mindful of an important issue that we are currently, uh, we currently have in the Haitian community in the state of New York. We don't have enough home ownership. By inference, I won't be surprised to see the same pattern in the state of New Jersey, for example. That lack of economic ownership is due both to our colonial education, because we have been educated into a system that has prepared our mindset not to become entrepreneurs, but to serve as employees of others. But also we have to consider the impact of the long duration dictatorship. Because in February 1986, as soon as Jean-Claude Duval left Haiti and went into exile in Paris, Haitians living abroad and more particularly the most qualified among them returned to Haiti because they miss their country. They return there, there because for a Haitian, Haiti is a sacred land. The Haitian who was born in Haiti has a spiritual and emotional connection to what the motherland or Haiti Sherry as Haitians want to call her in Haitian Creole. But until now, we don't have research to help us to answer the question to know how has the return of those Haitian living abroad has impacted their community in New York, New Jersey, Connecticut, Boston, Montreal, and so forth. Now, the next topic I would like to address in this lecture is the growing political power that we have, but that political power is not necessarily connected to economic power. According to data available, one can say that American citizens of Haitian descent or Haitian American have progressed in terms of political power. In Canada, in the United States of America, in Switzerland and other places, Haitians have been serving as elected officials at different levels. I am living in New York City, where we have more and more Haitian elected into office. There are also Haitian American as elected official in the state of New Jersey, Massachusetts, Florida, and other states. Many of those Haitian American elected officials are part of the national Haitian American elected official network, who current chairman is the Honorable Alex Desilme, council member of North Miami, Florida, and who has a doctoral degree in education. The Nihon is made of Haitian American who are currently serving as attorney general, mayor, state representative, council member, school board director, state assembly member, city clerk, county commissioner, among others. There is a tangible proof that now Haitians have political power. But one relevant question that we should ask is, what they have done with their political power. Have they used their political power to improve the life of Haitians living in their own community? What have we, Haitian living abroad, or if you prefer, member of the Haitian diaspora, have done to hold them accountable? Do we have a clear political education? So I am someone with intellectual training in politics. Currently, political sociology is one of my most important fields of specialization. 
I wrote my master dissertation, my master thesis in Latin American studies on election and democracy. I wrote my PhD dissertation on the political culture, culture of corruption of the Haitian elite. When I came to New York City or to CUNY, because of the political nature of my job as founding director of the CUNY Haitian Studies Institute, I put on pause my research on politics. But since 2016 to now, I have on a regular basis collected data on the political behavior of the Haitian American politician. The data collected allow me to point out that there is something wrong in the way that Haitian American elected official has performed politics. Many of them, not all, not all of them, okay, not of or not all of them, many of them has used their political power not to improve the life of the member of the Haitian community, but to advance their own agenda and have you the office to gain access to prestige, status, and personal privilege. The NEON, for instance, the National Haitian American Elected Official Network, for example, has used their platform to send statements about earthquake in Haiti, natal, natural catastrophe, and to ask the US government to get TPS for illegal immigrants, which is important. However, as I said earlier, in 2010, Haiti was hit by a major earthquake that killed, according to official data, 230,000 people. That same year, soldiers working for the United Nations for the stabilization of Haiti, MINUSTA, they brought in Haiti an epidemic cholera that killed 10,000 Haitians. And 800,000 uh, more were sick because of the cholera. But in the Haitian diaspora, we have talented lawyers. So question, what, what explain our incapacity to mount a dossier to force the United Nations to provide reparation to the victim of the cholera? We have currently Haitian Americans serving as attorney general in more than one state. Many of the Haitian American elected officials are lawyers, but also have remained silent on this issue. If they want, they could help the Haitian victim to get compensated from the United States or United Nations, sorry, an organization that apologizes for their wrongdoing in Haiti, but is reluctant to provide, to provide economic compensation to the victim. I am based in Brooklyn, where supposedly we supposedly we have a little Haiti. And recently some elected officials came together and renamed part of Flatbush Avenue, Jean-Baptiste Point du Sable, the Haitian immigrant who is recognized as the founder of the city of Chicago. Before that, some elected officials joined forces and renamed part of Nostron Avenue to Saint Louverture and Jean-Jacques Dessalines Boulevard. I personally think that those actions are important. For example, in the case of Jean-Jacques Dessalines, it is quite symbolically important to have his name on part of one of the mainstream of Brooklyn. Because we have to recall that from the Haitian independence until now, Jean-Jacques Dessalines, the founder of the state of Haiti, has always been portrayed as an assassin and a barbarian. So the renaming of Nostron Avenue as Jean-Jacques Dessalines Boulevard is quite relevant and is symbolically important for the image of Haitian. But beyond those artificial moves, what have we achieved? What have the Haitian American elected official did to strengthen economically the Haitian community? On May 2019, Little Haiti BK was officially launched in Brooklyn. During that celebration, Tonel Restaurant, located on Rogers Avenue, Jean-Jacques Dessalines Boulevard, was considered as central in the political project of Little Haiti. But less than one year after the launching of Little Haiti BK, Tonel Restaurant is closed definitely. As it happened for Tonel Restaurant, in the Haitian community, we have many small businesses, restaurants, barbershop, grocery, but Haitians do not host those buildings. 
We in the Haitian diaspora, we have been unable to put in place the tradition of la coup and combit that Haitian farmer have successfully been able to put into practice. Why are we celebrating some cosmetic achievement of our Haitian American elected official? They are vigorous process of gentrification that is underway. Long time member of our community are being displaced. Big developers are kicking them out of their community where they think they belong. The ongoing process of gentrification is affecting our Haitian community. And in some cases, some of our elected officials are contributing to this process. We have elected them in office, but they are not governing for us. They are practicing what we call in political science and political sociology, asymmetric political representation. Based on that precedent, as a sociologist, I wonder why have Haitian American elected officials not been able to use their political power to build some economic power in the communities where Haitian living abroad are living. Last point of my lecture to conclude. So last point of my lecture deal a brief diagnosis of the behavior of the religious or God organization in the Haitian diaspora. The main point I wanted to make in this section is that a church is not necessarily an instrument of alienation as Karl Marx argued in his political and sociological reflection on religion. In a community, a church can serve as a a means to create social bond, social cohesion. If we accurately read history, we can see that religion represents a powerful resources that our ancestors used to survive during slavery. Our ancestors have, in certain contexts, used religion as a tool to create what the French sociologist Emile Durkheim called a moral community. American history teaches us about the contribution of the Black church to foment social resistance to fight against slavery. And the Underground Railroad was a key example of that. But can we talk about the Haitian diaspora without paying some attention to the Haitian churches, to those religious institutions? What is the impact of Haitian churches on our community? How do Haitian churches serve as a tool of liberation, political consciousness, or have they operate as stay as site of oppression and alienation in the, the Haitian diaspora? I personally was born into a Catholic family in Haiti. When I was in junior high school, in junior college, sorry, in Port-au-Prince, I decided to convert it myself into into Protestantism, uh, into Protestantism. Into, I decided to convert it myself into Protestantism and more specifically into baptism. In my church in Haiti, I serve as a Sunday school teacher for the class of the deacons. That is to tell you how much I was involved into my church. When I moved to Brooklyn in 2016, I managed to attend several churches in my community. And since I am now also a professor of sociology, I have realized that if we want to become a more cohesive, cohesive community, we do need to have some serious conversation about our own religious organization. In the Haitian diaspora, many churches play an important role in helping us and our children to keep their Haitian identity. Every Sunday, how our children have to be well-dressed to attend to our churches. The church in terms of social, socialization helped a great deal in helping our kids to dress in a proper fashion, the Haitian fashion, the Haitian style, as we were accustomed to. Saturday and Sunday services help us to come together 
tout réunion à leur haïtianité, haïtianité, tout réunion à leur collective consciousness. In short, many churches in the Haitian diaspora have helped a lot in terms of the recreation of social linkages, self-expression, and self-identity. Since I am teaching sociology of religion at Brooklyn College, I have been collecting data on the Haitian church in the community. In the entrance of one church in the Haitian community in Brooklyn, there is a sign that says, and I'm quoting, where there is no vision, the people perish. But I ask, what is the vision of the Haitian churches for the Haitian community? Do they have a middle-term and long-term vision? Can the Haitian churches also help in the construction of that economic ownership that I have addressed in today's lecture? Many of our evangelical or Protestant churches in the Haitian community hold religious services on Sunday, Tuesday, Thursday, Friday, and Saturday. Question, are we rationally using our time, considering that we are living in the heart of the capitalistic system? Question, are we rationally use the physical space that we have as church? Question, do, you, you, do we use this space to build wealth in the Haitian diaspora? In the 21st century, as Haitian living abroad, we need to critically reflect on how our church can impact it socially, economically, and politically the Haitian diaspora. As a sociologist, I wanted to tell you that the church is not out of the society in which we are living. The church is located in the society. The leader of our church should understand that. They need to have a clear vision to help the community to go spiritually, socially, economically, and politically. Yes, politically too. In the age of denunciation of racism, the leader of our church in the diaspora, they need to do more. Jesus Christ was politically and socially engaged. Historically, the black churches here in the US have always been politically engaged. Back in the 19th century, many African-American churches, they stand against slavery. In AD 27, for example, Nathaniel Paul, an African-American reverend pastor, he directed talk of critique against slavery. He said that slavery was a monster and a devil. But guess what? All those African-American leaders, they were able to do that because they were inspired by the milestone of the Haitian Revolution. Because in Haiti, African showed to the world that Black people have their own dignity. They are that we are all part of the same human race. That we are not, they are not two or three races. We have different ethnicity, but we all belong to the same human family. This is something important that I wanted to remind you as we are having this sixth annual Clinton C. Coker Memorial Lecture. And in terms of recommendation, if we want to be a stronger community in the Haitian diaspora or Haitian living neighborhood, can we afford to neglect the role of the church of our religious institution in that process? Our religious institution need to have a bold vision that they will use to enhance the development of the community. We need to have leaders well equipped intellectually and spiritually. We need church with new attitude, religious institution that will teach youngsters about the need to invest in cryptocurrency and how to build group economy, so important to maintain a life the Haitian diaspora. Why others religious leaders have invested in building senior facility to take care of their elder? In Brooklyn, for example, I only know about one Haitian church that owns an affordable senior housing project. We need more religious leaders with that same vision. You who are based in Woodville and other places in New Jersey, 
I would like to encourage you to work with your religious leader, your community activists, your of your district, your elected official to have affordable senior housing project. This is also part of the mission of the church. So thank you so much for your attention and your patience. So I am looking forward to responding to your question. Thank you so, so much. Uh, thank you, Professor Sampol. Uh, Jen, do you want to handle the uh, question period or do you like me to do it? Oh, that's fine, Jeff. I think you can do that. I can? Yes. Okay. Well, uh, do we have any questions? I have a, a question and a comment. So I'm a Haitian American first generation and I always felt like diaspora was a definition for us because our parents were the immigrants. So I was just wondering how you felt about that. Like, do you consider us new Haitians to be part of the diaspora? So, uh, okay, um, so what's your, okay, a Nadine Chen. So Nadine Chen, I think that you, uh, actually, if you go, there is an article of the in the Haitian constitutions. Let me go back and I will, I put it in the, okay. According to the article 11 of the constitution of March 29, 1987, it is in Creole and French Nadine, so I did my translation. So children born outside uh, of Haitian father or Haitian mother uh, are Haitian. So I would consider yourself as Haitian American. You are both American and Haitian. You are not a diaspora. Because in Haiti, the origin of the diaspora is someone who left Haiti. We say that, you know, de-territorial, like you left Haiti. You're, you're someone who left Haiti. The first wave of migration in the 1960s. There was a second wave of migration in the 1970s. A third wave of migration in the 1980s, the phenomenon of the bought people. And then you will have a fourth wave of migration in 1991 when Jean Bertrand received, received the coup d'etat. And then we have another wave of migration after the earthquake. You know, and a new wave of migration, you know, after the new earthquake of August. Yes. Yeah. So we have different wave of migration. So people who were born in Haiti, Nadine, left Haiti at a specific time, in a specific time, they considered those people when they returned to Haiti, you say, oh, diaspora returned, you know, oh, the diaspora returned, but you, I won't consider you as member of the diaspora. So I will consider you as a Haitian, you are a Haitian and feel proud to have your both your American passport and your Haitian passport, no one can deny you that. So they didn't give us, you, the dual citizenship because Haiti is a country that is actually leading by a mafia and oligarchy, what I call in my research, the most repugnant elite. Because they know, as I said in my lecture, we have Haitian in all field of knowledge and expertise. Actually, I was on this space on Twitter, you know, actually you have, you know, Twitter is very trending with this space. You can just connect and listen and be part of conversation. I was in a conversation recently with Haitian people and they informed me that in NASA, the person who, one of the senior, you know, person who have a senior position to the, say yes or no, you know, about nuclear bomb is Haitian. So we have Haitian in every field of knowledge, but those people are Haitian, but the mafia in Haiti made basically by light skin, uh, you know, um, uh, uh, people, they are fear of competition. They invest a lot of money in the Haitian elected official, not Haitian American, Haitian elected official, our senator, uh, you know, our um, a, a, a assembly member, the member of the parliament in Haiti, to not pass the whole citizenship. But for me, you are not part of the diaspora. So they classify you in the diaspora, but for me, it's wrong. You are just Haitian and Haitian American. That's
Thank you. So I'm a zoo. That's all I am. <laughs> Thank you. Anybody else have a question? I think the the whole the whole idea of, uh, of of contrasting between diaspora and Haitians living abroad is very interesting. It it bears it bears a lot of analysis. Um, now, I guess my my understanding of the original you know of the Jewish diaspora is that it was not we don't we don't refer. I mean, I'm Jewish myself. I don't refer to the movement of the Hebrews from Egypt to Canaan as a diaspora. We refer to the diaspora as the period after the Romans destroyed mm -hmm. the Jewish state mm -hmm. in the first century AD and where the Romans deliberately scattered they 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 drove the jewish people out of palestine because they they didn't want them to be a center of resistance and and so that that um but nevertheless you still have the idea now the diaspora the jewish diaspora forever after they they all they they also did consider palestine as the promised land Although I think in, 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 in today's world, well, there, there, are, there are some people who believe that if you're really Jewish, then you need to go to Israel and be an Israeli. Mm -hmm. But on the other hand, there are others who are completely comfortable. You know, like you say, there, there are places like the United States and Canada treat Jewish people well enough that they're considered almost an, an alternative promised land for those people who were born there. Mm -hmm. It's a, the, the whole thing is a very interesting question. I'm glad that you've raised it. Uh, that's a very interesting comment and very intelligent and smart comment you made, Jeff. Um, I would say that I agree with you. Um, uh, on because there is not a unique, unidimensional um, interpretation of diaspora, but in the scholarly literature, what we while we return to the book of Exodus, it's because you know you refer, for instance, what happened in Rome, you know, uh, uh, to the Jewish, but in uh, the scholarly literature. For, for without that exodus, because we use in English the concept of uh, exit in Spanish, salida, sorti. The, the, because for us, uh, without that exodus, you know, that move from Egypt to enter, you know, cross uh, the, the, the desert uh, and to enter into the from Iceland into Kana, uh, for instance, Moses didn't get a chance to see that from Iceland. So that idea of Exodus, although the concept of diaspora was not born there, but that's why I said it, it's sociogenesis. So the genesis is like the beginning where everything started. For instance, in liberation theology, that was a very powerful um, movement, social and political movement of freedom of liberation that was born inside the Catholic Church and also inside Protestant Church, but more specifically inside the Catholic Church in the late 1960s and 1970s. So they always return to the book of Exodus, to the book of Exodus, and there is a specific a specific verse in the book of Exodus. I put it in a, in, a, in a footnote. I don't know if I can, I will be able to find that footnote. But anyway, so in the book of Exodus, uh, it's like the exit. You know, it's like a long process. There are different moments, but the moment of Exodus is very important. And they associate also that idea with, you know, 
uh, when Moses and then uh, uh, that Exodus is definitely important because without that Exodus, if we don't take into account that Exodus, we are we miss an important moment, right? So this is the way that in the scholarly uh, in the scholarly tradition we 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 use that. But also your point on Palestine and and Israel is very interesting, uh, but because also uh, there are different typology. Jewish people, they don't see uh, the world the same way. You know that uh, very well. There are different typology in the, you know, Jewish thought. Uh, if you write, uh, you know, if you read, for instance, Hannah Arendt, Hannah Arendt offers different perspectives. You know, you have some Jewish, who are, if the Jewish, if the Jew is a secular Jew, a non-secular Jew that also inform his or her world view. So that is very important, but with the establishment of the state of Israel, I think it was in 1948. So we will see more and more, actually with uh, a religious fundamentalism, with uh, that uh, it was like, uh, uh, that was very strong when Ronald Reagan came into power in 1981 and then the last, President was Donald John Trump. We will see more association and more perversion on actually on the debate between Palestine and Israel when Donald John Trump he decided it was on uh, December to change the embassy, the U.S. embassy from Tel Aviv to uh, Jerusalem is also part of the political process you know, and the perversion of Jewish thought. And that has to deal also with the, uh, the way, the interaction between religious fundamentalism and how religious fundamentalism shape politics and policy in the US. But you are totally right. There are many Jewish for them, the promised land is still Palestine. But with the rise of religious fundamentalism, you see different form of new anti-Semitism, you know? So the concept of anti-Semitism per se is not a concept stable, you know? Um, it depends according to time, according to history. And, and we the, have, nature, the nature of anti-Semitism has changed over the mm -hmm. centuries. From one Definitely, thing yeah, I agree. Well, it, it just occurred to me also that, that, that actually when you think, if you go back even before the Exodus, the original di diaspora, if you if you if you consider that the, the the Hebrews came to be as a people in in or around Palestine, then when when there was a famine in the land, they went down into Egypt. That may have been actually the original diaspora, and it may not have been all the Hebrews, just part of them. But some of them, well, at least according to the Bible, they, they, they had a good reception there at first because Joseph had gone before them. Mm -hmm. But that, that to me is more of, of a diaspora than the Exodus. The Exodus is more of a return from the diaspora, if you think of it that way. But, I, but you know, we're getting too far away from Haiti. Let's, okay, yes. let's cycle back to Haiti. This is my fault. I shouldn't have done that. Uh, I, you know, it's, it's very interesting also, I, I, I uh, the, uh, I think if you're talking about religion among Haitian people, mm -hmm. there has been, I think, really the, uh, before Duvalier, I think you, it was really fair to say that most Haitians were at least outwardly Catholic. Uh, or at least, at least they 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 were, they belonged to the Catholic Church in one form or another. Mm -hmm. But I think it was beginning with the Duvalier regime that all of a sudden you had a lot of Haitians turning to Protestantism. Uh, it's more complex than that, Jeff. It's yeah. more complex than that because actually Haiti, Haiti, you know, is an African country in America. Haiti is an African right. country. When you see Haitian in their culture. If you go to Haiti and then 
you go to maybe count, an African country, you will see the same thing. Haiti is just an uh, African country in, the, in America, but actually religion has always played an important role in Haiti because many people, they when it's, and, and that has to deal Jeff with colonization, the colonial education we, most of us receive, if not all of us receive, the way they, you know, silence African history, they present us, you know, what they want to Africa. But Africa is a, one of the most important continent when it comes to what we call in sociology, uh, religious diversity and religious pluralism. So when the transatlantic slave happened, so we have African, from different religion or non-religion belief, faith, and practice in Saint Domingue that will became, become Haiti after the independence. So, for instance, the ceremony of Wakaima that happened between August 14 and August 21 of the year 1791. So many say that it was a Vodou ceremony. Now there are other debates that Bookman, one of the main leaders, was not really a Vodou, a, a Vodou priest, but belonged to Islam. So religion, so the Haitian Revolution was possible also with because of a confluence of different forms of spirituality. For me, the ceremony of Bwakaim of 1791 was more a political congress than a really one religion uh, activities. But I am telling you that, Jeff, just to tell you that Haiti has always had a pluralistic social cultural environment. But what's happened in, by January 1st, 1804, the Haitian who will lead Haiti, what I call in my research, the post-colonial elite, Jeff, they adopted the same reflex as the colonial elites because we have to be mindful that Haiti disrupted the global racist order, the global you know, world order in a world that was based on racism, bigotry, white supremacy, the Haitian revolution changed that axiologically, epistemologically uh, and so in 1804, Haiti was a country that was isolated. So many of the Haitian elites were dated. So in order to legitimate and get acceptation in the world, so they will, uh, you know, reproduce the same pattern as their former master. They will embrace Christianity to say that Haitian people, because it was a time if you were Christian, Christian was a map of, you know, civilization. And they will, uh, they will reject their own religion, their popular religion, including Haitian Vodou. Their popular religion was not Haitian Vodou, but Haitian Vodou was part of that. So Jeff, you have a country since 1804 until the constitution of March 29, 1987. So they didn't recognize the popular religion of Haitian. You know, they didn't recognize voodoo, for example, you know, but that didn't mean that Haitian was, were Catholic. Haitian have always been practicing what we call a kind of, you know, symbiotic religion, syncretism. So Haitian publicly, they can say they were Catholic, but in their private life, they were practicing all their religion, their African religion. Point, point is well taken, yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So yeah, that, and, and also since the government of Jean-Pierre Boyer, we are talking about the beginning of the 19th century, you had the introduction of many Protestant churches in Haiti, right? So many African Americans remember in the 19th century, uh, the government of Jean-Pierre Boyer uh, and Jean uh, Alexandre Pétion and then Jean-Pierre Boyer they will, you know, encourage the migration of African American to Haiti, and also with the African uh, uh, migrate, African American migration to Haiti, many African American they will bring to Haiti, or uh, uh, you know, Protestantism. 
So Protestantism have been in Haiti for a while, but what's happened is like, you know, throughout uh, history, we will see more and more process of diversification of the religious, you know, religious sphere. So more specifically, after the movement of the 1950s and the 1960s, the movement of the 1960s were movement also to challenge the authority of the Catholic Church. So that explain why, for instance, we had the Second Council of Vatican. The Second Council of Vatican was a strategy of the Catholic Church to see what was happening in its environment because a religion is a system and a system cannot survive without the environment. So, and there were many changes happening in the environment of the Catholic Church. So in order to adapt itself to the world, so the Vatican to the Pope would made some reform inside the Catholic Church, but the Protestantism and other religion have been always challenging the authority of the Catholic Church in Haiti and other places here. Of course, yeah, I'm, I'm just thinking though that the, within the, uh, for example, within the Haitian American community, there is a tremendous diversity of, you know, so, so of, of religious observance, let me put it that way. Mm -hmm. And so therefore, you, it, it's, it's hard really to talk about, <clears throat> isn't, isn't it a little difficult to talk about the church and the Haitian American community in, 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 uh, in the singular? No, it's like in plural, in plural. When I say, the, it's like I mentioned, you know, uh, when I say, you see, I mentioned Saturday and Sunday church work. So who worship on Saturday, the Adventists of seven day and others. So yeah, it's, it's, uh, you are correct. It's not, I didn't uh, mention it in plural. In singular, it was in plural. For instance, my, and the Haitian people is very tolerant religiously to, uh, speaking. Myself, I grew up, I was born in Porto, I, in the South, I moved in Porto Prince when I was 13 to pursue my studies. I grew up in a household in Porto Prince, uh, in Kafoufe, with a, a cousin and, co you know, my many cousins. And, you know, some, we were Protestant or the Catholics or the member of the Adventists of the Seventh Day. And we all respect the religious belief and non-religious belief. The Haitian person traditionally is someone who is very tolerant toward other religion. Is not someone who will express the kind of religious bigotry there. Quite right. Yes, that's that's my experience of Haitian people. Well, I'm looking at the time and we are at um, 8 p.m. This has been a great um, presentation. Thank you, Dr. St. Paul, for um, giving us that very, very extensive um, overview. And I learned a lot um, this evening. I think we might have time for one more question from, is there anyone else in the group that would like to ask a question? I have an anonymous question to ask, do you have hope for better Haitian collaboration because there are more and more Haitian American elected leaders? Yes, uh, I think that collab improvement of, uh, so can you re rephrase the question because I want to be uh, sure that I answered the question you asked Nancy. So it's not my question, but since okay, there's okay. more Haitian American leaders, okay. Uh -huh. Do you think that there's a, a better chance that there's going to be um, more collaboration? Okay, that's a great question. Um, politics, to answer that question, let me get started by saying politics is just a means, nothing for the anonymous person who ask the question. Politics is just a means, politics is not an end. So I am proud, we Haitian, we are proud when we have Haitian American elected into office. It's not something that makes us upset. But we found with ethics, politics is useless, nothing. And what 
I think it would be important. It is important to have quantity of Haitian American elected into office. Quantity matters. We appreciate when we have five, 10, 20, 50, 100, 150. Every time we can have more and more Haitian American elected officials, it would be better. But the most important thing is not the quantity, is we should ask what is the ethics that the elected official is using in her or her way to practice politics. And for responding to that question, we have to go back and read one of the most important scholar in politics that was the German Max Weber. Max Weber in 1990, he, 1919, he gave a lecture in German entitled Politics as Vivo, that is politics as vocation. And in that conference, Weber told us that a good politician is someone who will use politics, you know, live uh, for politics. That means someone who will not use the office to grab, you know, own privilege for himself and herself while his or her community is going down. So the idea is not we are against the quantity, but is the idea of ethics. So we need more and more elected officials with ethics of commitment, with ethics of service to the community. And Weber explained that with two concepts, ethics of responsibility and ethics of conviction. And also, we need Haitian elect, American elected officials to not be afraid as scholar like me, because politics is a science. Without critic, we cannot improve. They need to think that they, they need to know that they have to work with scholar because scholar, we are the one who know study politics. We can, because we have many Haitian American elected officials, they are not politicians. They become politicians by, but they were not training intellectually as politics. I am training intellectually to, to practice politics. So they need to work with people, with the professional in their community. They need to work with the school leaders, the teacher, the community activists. In some, they need to just see themselves as a public servant. That came from Latin, servai, that means slave. So when you are a good politician, you give yourself for a cause that is bigger than you. You give yourself for the cause to advance your community. This is the way I wanted to answer that question for your anonymous uh, 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 person, Nancy. Okay, thank you. But just to piggyback on that, you know, the New York eviction moratorium ends in January. And then you mentioned something about Haitians being homeless, which caught me off guard because I've never seen our culture not be cohesive. Like I can't see someone letting a member of their family end up homeless. So that would go back to the economic division because I usually debate with like Nigerians and other um, blacks from different countries that everybody seems to be family at home, but when they come to the US, they start to get this individual you know, mindset. So I was just wondering how you felt about that. Okay, that's a good question also. That's why in my lecture, I stress on, actually I think Haiti, our problem is not big. If we don't have that much problem, that's it. Uh, the solution of Haiti is simple. I myself, I was born in the countryside of Haiti. I moved to Port-au-Prince when I was 13. But Haiti, we are a country with a very strong, a culture of solidarity. I don't, if you go to Haiti, the farmer, when they, the strategy they use to work is la coup, combit. So Haiti, we should, as Haitian, we should just look on our farmer, on our tradition, and practice that culture of la coup. So for instance, and we maintain that culture of la coup to somehow, 
Because if you see the amount of money, what we call remittances, that we send to Haiti, how many times, even though you didn't go to Haiti, Nadine, but how many times you have to go to Western Union, you have to go to MoneyGram to send transfer. So Haitian, Jamaican, so we, Haitian is the one of the Google start that send more money to Haiti. That also is one of the uh, um, uh, um, factors that explain why we are not strong economically. Uh, we are not economically strong here because every time we have a saving, we have to send to Haiti. Now we have kidnapping. So we have family, sometimes they kidnap and we have to send money, you know, uh, to liberate those persons. So in Haiti, we have a strong um, a sense of culture of solidarity and we maintain that culture of solidarity. But unfortunately, we are living in the heart of the capitalist system. For instance, for instance, myself, I'm living in New York and New York is the empire state. So I am living in the heart of the empire. So, and one of the uh, uh, characteristics of capitalism is individualism. So when we came here, or when we have our children, like you first generation, so believe it or not, you inherit, you know, because the school you attend, the culture of the US is different than the culture of Haiti. The culture of Haiti, the US is a culture of individualism. Individualism is not totally bad because individual, without individuality, look at me. I like myself. So if I didn't like myself, I wouldn't, you know, so, you know, the way I introduce myself in society is part of my individuality. You need, a certain doses of individuality, because if you cannot, if you don't like yourself, if you don't take care of yourself, you cannot take care of others. So in that sense, that culture of individuality is important. But individualism of hyper-individualism is a cancer, is a cancer anti. So and unfortunately, you have families here, so they, Mm, uh, you know, they have their, their, their kids and they say, oh, after you turn 18 years, you have to leave the house. Other, we don't do that. Other family, you have your kids, you want to see your children with you. But other, they embrace, we call that integration. They embrace the other culture totally without making that balance between your original culture you know, and the new culture of your community of, adapt, of adoption. But I didn't want to make individuality, but I know many Haitians and sometimes people who graduate from college who are homeless here, eh? who are homeless. Yes, we are homeless. So the oftentimes we are Haitian, we don't want, uh, but maybe if they don't know that, because they don't have my sociological imagination. When I am using a train, the two or five train or the crew train in, in Brooklyn, so I am doing my observation. I'm doing, a, do, a, a, and sometimes I talk to people, but this is what we call in sociolo sociological imagination. So not everyone has the capacity of that sociological imagination. So sometimes people cannot see what I see. But I see many things, and among those things that I see, I saw Haitian in uh, uh, facing homelessness in, 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 in Brooklyn. Eh? I don't have the numbers, but I know that we have also homeless. Okay, thank you. Okay. Well, thank you so much. It looks like um, if anyone has any parting comments or um, anything for the good of the evening? I want to, uh, oh, Bruce, are you speaking? You're muted if you're trying to speak. Bruce, unmute mute yourself. Let's see. Let, let me see if I can unmute him. See, yeah. I am, see if I am a co-host, let me see if I can yeah. unmute him too. Bruce, I think Bruce to unmute me. 
he's still he's still on mute eh? i asked yeah, him to still... unmute but you know it's that is about is about technology so yeah <laughs> right we're yeah we're still adapting to this yes that's correct that's correct or maybe um, you could put your question in, in the chat bruce oh, okay ask him to put his question or comment in the chat so i can respond if he is not able to speak Bruce, you've either got to unmute yourself or put your question or comment in the chat. Looks like he's going to try to chat. <laughs> Type okay. it in. So, so we'll wait. I really uh, appreciate, I'm Jamaican, uh, Professor okay. St. Paul. So a lot of the um, uh, observations that you had about um, the Haitian immigrant community, I, I could really relate to the remittances, mm -hmm. um, church, <laughs> mm -hmm. and how we have to dress a certain way to, mm -hmm. to go to church, and really the importance of um, the churches in our immigrant, um, in yeah. our Caribbean yeah. communities for mm -hmm. really um, building mm -hmm. capacity, mm -hmm. um, working to solve um, food insecurity, housing mm -hmm. insecurity is, is so important, so. Yeah, actually, I belong to the Department of Sociology, and in my department, I have, you know, so I am one of the faculty. If you see me on campus every day, I have a different suit. And <laughs> students, they yeah. might call and say, oh, how come you are sociologist? You should. But it has to deal also with my socialization because yeah. I was socialized, you know, in Catholic school and then in church. That also has shaped the way I dress. You know, so sometimes uh, one day I was working on campus before the pandemic and a woman was behind me and she said in Haitian Creole, uh, she said in Haitian Creole, look my Haitian man. And I turned around because I came here in 2016. I turned around because I, she didn't see my face and I turned around and I hate her. How do you know that I'm Haitian? She said, no, the way you dress, the way you work with your dignity, I know that you are Haitian, you know? So, and, and, and that is very important when we talk about with Haitian. There are a certain way we use to dress. You know, society evolved, the Haitian society evolved, uh, you know, not necessarily for uh, the good, but, for us, church is very important in our Haitian culture. And also, as I said in the question comment I uh, replied to, uh, to Jeff, uh, the, the uh, bookman, the guy who started uh, Ceremony Bwakaima, he was born in Jamaica. He was Jamaican. So we have a, a strong connection between Haiti, Haiti and the, Domin the jo Jamaica, for instance, the Maroon Society, the Maroons, you know, is something that both in Haiti and in Jamaica, you know, and also in Mexico, in some uh, black community in Mexico. So we have that tradition of Maroon. So when Bob Marley say, Buffalo soldier, Jedlock Rasta, stolen from Africa, brought to America. But when they brought us to America, many of us resisted because we never want to be enslaved. And that was something that was characteristic of um, Jamaican captive and Haitian captive, mm -hmm. you know, because we refuse to be enslaved. Mm -hmm. And in Jamaica, there are many community of my own who never were enslaved. Yeah, absolutely. So it looks like we lost Bruce. Oh, uh, no, he's on, on mute now. He can speak. He's you, unmuted? Yes, okay. he's unmuted. Say something, Bruce. Bruce, you can oh. go ahead. Yes, there he is. Yeah. Bruce, just yes, speak. Yeah, it's 
Um, here's, here is a question through chat. Mm -hmm. um, what do you think of Haitian businesses in the tri-state mm -hmm. area? Can you name one that is doing a good job of transcending divisions? And is there one that you admire? Okay, so I said mm -hmm. I have to remember um, I am based in Brooklyn. Most of my sociological field work, I did that in Brooklyn. Although, uh, because of the nature of my job as the founding director of the Haitian Studies Institute, I used to respond to invitation uh, to go to Connecticut um, and also to um, uh, um, uh, in, in New Jersey, but in East Orange, New Jersey. So, but I don't have a strong knowledge of Haitian communities in New Jersey and Connecticut. So I am not that qualified to respond a question on Haitian business on the twisted area. But what I can tell you, I think that many Haitian businesses, you know, um, we, what I, many Haitian businesses uh, are more individual business and not really collective business Co because we have other ethnicity. Uh, for instance, uh, if in Brooklyn, if you start working for those who, who, who might know Brooklyn from Avenue H to uh, let's say to um, um, to Prospect Park, uh, you will file a bunch of Haitian barbers. In other community, you can see those Haitian bar, those barbers, they, uh, you know, uh, there is a certain help. They own their building where they have, but we don't have that in the Haitian community. So I think um, maybe we have some business who are doing good, for instance, in Brooklyn. Remember I said, I cannot talk about Connecticut and New Jersey in Brooklyn. I used to go before the pandemic, I used to go to Park Slope and to have dinner as a Haitian restaurant whose name is Bikenai or in Creole, Bikanef. Though Bikenai is owned by many Haitians, I think two or three Haitians together. Also, we had another business that was uh, striving in the community. It was a restaurant that was called La Cai Restaurant, uh, very close to the Atlantic Barclay Center. La Cai Restaurant was a collective business. But guess what? La Cai Restaurant is closed. I think also one of the problems that, uh, this is my sociological imagination, I think one of the problems of the Haitian businesses, sometimes there are certain grants. For instance, when COVID-19 hit, there were many federal grant or state grant for small businesses. But for instance, the Brooklyn Chambers manage many grants, but many owner of small business, they didn't have access to the information. They didn't know. So they need in terms of mentorship to have access to the proper information at the accurate moment. And I think that is something that is lack, that is missing, you know, in the Haitian community and not only in Brooklyn, but I think we can also say the same thing for um, uh, New Jersey and Connecticut. For instance, in, in Long Island, we have a very important Haitian business is Chemirel Restaurant. But Chemirel Restaurant is owned by one person. And in the community, if you want to do business, you have to embrace LACU, you have to embrace combitism. We need to create trust among us to join together. We are here in, uh, in this, uh, the US in the 1960s, Canada the same. I went to Canada for a conference in 2006 where, and I was that, at that time I was living in Mexico. So in Mexico, I didn't have access to Haitian food. And in Canada, I said, oh, I want to eat uh, Haitian food. But they took me to a private house in which a family 
set a, set up their own business in their in their you know in their own houses. So we are not strong when it comes together to put our money and to have a bold vision that can unite not one person. This is my point, okay? But I'm not saying that we don't have any important business. But when you have one business managed by one person, it's like, it's, it's very risky to maintain it for a very, very long term, okay? Okay, let's see. Did we get Bruce back or did we lose him again? He was here momentarily, <laughs> but, uh, oh yeah, he's here. Um, Bruce, did you wanna say something? Uh, I think we lost him again. Oh, yep, yeah, there he is. Okay. But Bruce is not speaking. Yeah, yeah. Well, um, as, as we are having folks um, drop off, um, mm -hmm. again, I'd, I'd like to uh, thank New Jersey Haiti Partners. Thank you, Jeff. Um, thank Nadine you, Jeff. Had to, Thanks to Brooke. Nadine Dale. had to drop off. <laughs> Um, thank you, Mrs. Crocker, for uh, for being here um, and supporting as as always. I see Karine on the call, um, uh, a great partner in the Haitian community. Um, from Brookdale, we just want you all to know that we are here for you. We are your community college. Um, we have support for anyone seeking access to educational opportunities, um, retraining um, in technical skills, um, seeking a degree. We're happy to um, happy to always work within the community to um, um, help students get access to our programs. We have um, we call community navigators who are able to come out into the community and help people fill out their financial aid forms. So um, we just want you to know that Brookdale is here for you and um, call on us at any time if you um, need us. Um, if anyone from NJ Partners would like to say any closing comments, we can well, entertain that at this time. Thank, thanks again to Brookdale for hosting this presentation. And thanks very much to Professor Sam Paul for a, a very stimulating and provocative presentation. I'm, I know he made me think, and I got light, I, I'll bet he made a lot of the rest of you think too. And, and thank you so, so much to both. Uh, to uh, New Jersey partner and to book the community college to join force and to invite me. So I enjoyed the talk and so it was a great pleasure and thank you so much. And thank you to all the participants for the question to Nadine and to also the anonymous who asked question. <laughs> yes, Karine has her hand raised. Go ahead, Karine. Hi, everyone. Thanks for being here. Just wanted to say thank you to our partner, Brookdale Community College, in helping us uh, have this sixth annual event. Uh, New Jersey Haiti Partners has been around since 1976, continuously operated both in New Jersey and in Haiti. And one of the things we provide are scholarships for kids graduating from uh, the Jersey Shore area. We've been doing that for the past five years. And we also have um, schools that we support in Haiti. So we support education both here as well as in Haiti in various ways with our different partner organizations. Uh, some are taking place in North Jersey through uh, Nadine's organization. So once you get involved with New Jersey Haiti Partners, there's room to bring your talent, your skill, your um, particular thing in life that you want to see happen. And uh, we would love to continue to keep in touch with you. So please, if you did not register through our Eventbrite, um, you can sen send us an email and uh, this way you can get on our mailing list. And I'm going to put our email address in the chat for you so that you can send us an email. That way you'll be um, notified about, about um, new, events that we have coming up. So the email address is nj as in New Jersey, Haiti partners at gmail.com. 
njkatypartners at gmail.com. Thank you so much. Thanks, Kareen. And I'm, um, I noticed that one of my colleagues just hopped on and I hope she doesn't um, uh, mind. I would like to put her on the spot if she's able to. Um, I was talking, I was mentioning that, that Brookdale is your community college and Brookdale is um, here to serve you and to support you. Um, we recently hired a um, new director of diversity um, and um, she also works with the Community College Opportunity Grant Program. Um, so um, Angela Cariatis um, has been a real breath of fresh air um, and energy and engagement um, to the community college. And her department is um, um, really out there in the community promoting um, diversity and um, equity and inclusion activities, but also um, providing programs that help connect students who are interested in educational opportunities at the college. So um, just wanted to let you know that. And if Angela, if you're able to unmute and just say hello, that'll be great. If, if you're not in a position to do that, that's fine as well. I am, I am. I'm sorry okay. that I had my camera off. I was that's okay. running into the house. Uh, I, I didn't want to miss this. Can I, can I say just two words about, yes. and, and thank you that this is, um, being recorded. Uh, thank you, sir, for everything that you're offering in this time. Uh, one of the things that a lot of people don't know, uh, all of you know about it, but it's so important to learn about Haitian history and the revolt, a successful revolution uh, for, for independence. And I always situate this in, in class, especially in our creative work. I have to let everybody know that I come to these conversations as an artist creative making for collective liberation and, and always situating and bringing in guests to talk about what a successful revolution, independence, uh, what, it, what it is like. So I just wanna say thank you for this work. I can't wait to check out the recording and, and to see everything that I missed up until this point. Deep gratitude and, and solidarity for all of this. Thank you. Thank you, Angela. Thank you so much, Angela. I appreciate your, your, uh, your, your speaking. Words. Did we hear Bruce? <laughs> oh, thank you, Jake, for asking that. How can we access the recording? Um, we are going to make the recording, um, the recording should be available tomorrow. And um, if someone will tell me where to email the link, um, perhaps Kareen or Nadine, I'll send it to them and Jeff and um, they can make it available. We are also, we do have a YouTube channel um, for through my office, the Global Citizenship Project YouTube channel. And so we will also post this recording um, there. So it will be on, on YouTube. Wow, I didn't know that you know, in Brookdale you have that because in El Colegio de Mexico, where I got my PhD in sociology, although I would, my PhD dissertation on political corruptions of the Haitian elites, but uh, there is a tradition at El Colegio de Mexico that before we defending the thesis, the doctor, the PhD thesis, you have to defend a pre-doctoral thesis that it should be a topic different than the topic of your PhD. And the topic of my pre-doctoral dissertation was on sociology of citizenship. So it was a, a work on citizenship. So, so that means we have to have you back again at Brookdale. <laughs> definitely, definitely. Great, so um, I think that will be it. Um, this has been a very um, impactful and amazing evening. Um, again, thanks Dr. St. Paul for um, coming to Brookdale virtually. I hope the next time you come to Brookdale, it can be in person, <laughs> okay? And, um, and, and I really mean that, um, that we would love to have you again, um, again at the college. Um, our, um, department, the International Education Center, um, uh, one of our programs is the Global Citizenship Project. And our whole theme for the next two years is transcending divisions. 
So um, those of you here on the call, I invite you to check out our website. It's just brookdalecc.edu forward slash international. And there you can navigate to a link international events. So by January, we will have the events up for the spring semester that will um, include a lot, um, a lot more programming related to this theme of how we um, transcend divisions to find solutions and um, find common ground. Um, we will be starting with um, a human library project. There's a, going to be an art exhibit um, that some students are curating, um, focusing on a, um, a young man who's traveling, who's walking around the world. We have um, um, some film screenings um, focusing on um, um, Israeli and Palestinian issues and um, we have a, a, a documentary um, film that's also um, created by some high school students that traced um, the journey of um, a Holocaust survivor um, when he was a, a young man on one of the death trains. So some very um, interesting, informative and engaging programs coming up in the spring semester. So we hope that you all will, will stay tuned for that. And with that, I would like to bid you all a great evening. And thank you so much for participating and, and coming. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you so, so much. <laughs>